Welcome to the uh, Biloxi City Council meeting, special meeting today, Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. I need a motion on the agenda. So moved. Moved by Mr. Lawrence. Second. Second by Dr. Tisdale. Any questions? That being said, none. All in favor? Okay, 5-0. Motion carried. Presentation agenda, mayor's report. No report from the mayor, from the council. Mr. Lawrence? No report. Ms. Newman? Dr. Tizel? Nothing. Mr. Glavin? No report. And I also have no report. All right, we're going to move on to the public agenda. I'm going to ask that, that, uh, that because, because this is being recorded, please speak into the microphone. Please speak into the microphone. That also goes uh, for the council members. Um, we got a total of 45 minutes, uh, three minutes per person, three minutes per person, and it's going to be strictly, strictly three minutes. And we're going to stop you at three minutes. So I'm going to start with my left. Anyone on my left would like to speak? Anyone on my left? Please state your name and address for our records and please sign in. Hi, my name is Suzanne huber Guiot. I live at 14360 John Lee Road in Biloxi. Um, my question um, is, I hope you explain the uh, reasoning or logic behind adding a conditional use to the commercial uh, business zoning. Um, I'm still unclear on why that's added instead of just allowing the business license and the occupancy license to identify the short-term rentals. Uh, the conditional use application onto some uh, uh, community or building that already has a uh, right, use by right, um, doesn't really make sense. So I'm trying to understand the logic behind adding a, another layer to them and basically taking away some of their rights um, as they will not be able to sell um, in the future and they actually purchased uh, with this uh, business in mind to be able to do uh, short-term rentals. So. That's all I need for today. Thank okay. you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else on my left? Good morning. I'm just going to ask that you um, again recognize that we have 48 doors at Cypress Cove that all open up into a common area and we would appreciate if you would agree with the Planning and Zoning Committee that we are not the uh, condominium place that could use short-term rentals. We've had some real issues and we would all like to just retire in peace and we're asking you to vote that Cypress Cove not be allowed to have short-term rentals. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else to my left? Mr. Engine? my comments were pretty much summed up the last Tuesday we met on this same issue and then I sent each one of you an email which I hope you got it memorialized the same thing that I said so I don't need to repeat it but um, the bottom line on that is let, let's keep the sanctity of the residential zones including multifamily I think it's important most of those back right up to single family we don't need that encroaching we don't need to have the possibility in the future of a conditional use being granted. Let's try to look out for our single family uh, uh, neighborhoods, even if they're on Highway 90, because they've been there for a long time. I represent the uh, uh, Marva family, and I have worked with both Cypress Cove and other folks in and around that neighborhood, and they are very concerned that their single family neighborhood is going to be affected adversely as it has been in the past. So. I'd appreciate the consideration during the workshop of 
making all of the residential areas, no matter what they are, RM20, RM30 included in particular, in the area where they are prohibited, the short terms are prohibited. And I didn't say my name. It is Wayne Hingen. Uh, I'm an attorney, uh, 979 Howard Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to my left? Hello, my name is James Casho, and I live at Cypress Cove. People don't understand that all our doors open up to the common areas, and when we, we live here, and when you have vacation and people there, they're making noise, you're jumping in the pool, screaming, hollering, and my door is six feet from the pool. And if I would have known that, I would have, you know, if I'd known this was going to be allowed to happen, I would have bought a unit toward the back. So this is the reason why I don't think we need to have vacation people, short term rentals at Cypress Cove. Because, it, it, you know, we all work, we live there, and it's just, it's just not fair for us to have to deal with vacationers. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had to go out. There were six children in the pool, unaccompanied, throwing the pool equipment inside the pool, Coke cans, jumping off the fence in the pool, and I had to go out there and get them down. The mothers had to come out, and I told them, I said, can you please keep an eye on your children? These were kids like five, six to eight years old. And if something would have happened, our HOA would have been sued. So this is why I don't think it's fair to us to have to deal with this. And anything you could do to help us would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on my left? Hi, my name is Benjamin Sims. Uh, I live at 145 Gill Avenue in Biloxi. Um, I'm here to talk about the bill that's on the agenda today, not Cypress Cove down the road. Um, my wife and Kelly and I own multiple properties in Biloxi, some of which we've used for short-term rentals, servicing the needs of families seeking a home versus a motel or casino, Keesler spouses, families seeking proximity to their training military members, cruising the coast vacationers, and other screened Airbnb tenants. Before you today is a flawed bill with well in, put together by a well-intentioned staff. The fact is there had been 17 total applications put in in the entire city before this came on the agenda. And now, as a result of just the threat of the fine going up to $500 a day, as of the last meeting I attended, Director Creel indicated over 170 applications had come in in uses by right. It seems to me that that accomplishes what should be the ultimate goal of Airbnb legislation, which is getting them on record, fire compliance, safety compliance, renewal fees. Taking away the right of someone who purchased in a zone by right in, is going to unfairly, uh, making a unit by the month is going to make any unit the bill is a misunderstanding as to what the issues the short-term operators have with your process. It is not registering it, it is not paying an annual fee, meeting fire compliance, meeting guest registry compliance. It is the failure of the way the conditional use standards are applied to the whim of neighbors, sometimes blocks away, to simply impose their will on other citizens' use of the property. The conditional use does not appear to be the best method to go about taking these what now appear to be condominiums primarily in some apartments and getting them under compliance. I don't think the best use of a 14 member non-elected board to sit through every two weeks for months, potentially years, for hundreds of conditional use applications every time ownership transfers over, which is what this bill would do, would require as soon as ownership transfers over the same condo in a building that has every other unit theoretically approved still goes up and has the chance that a neighbor can come in and just not want that particular unit and if it's the wrong neighbor then the committee goes the other way 
I really think that this, this council should look at a rewrite of the bill with taking the good things, certainly the implementing the fines made a lot of sense to get people on record, but things, I just got too much for three minutes. There's, all, there's so much to say about this. But I really think you should set up a separate council or administrative process that, that is focused entirely on short-term rentals, not trying to apply these macro conditional use applications to every application of the city. And I got lots more to say if you all let me come back up. But thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. Anyone else on my left? Anyone on my right? You know, one on my right. Yes, sir. Mr. Genza. My name is Frank Genzer. I live at 145 St. Jude Street, uh, 130. which is a residential neighborhood. And I'd like to uh, protect the sanctity of that residential neighborhood by eliminating short-term rentals, uh, in particular when it comes to condominiums. Uh, I don't see the basis that once you provide, once you allow one um, residence or one unit in a condominium project, what the basis would be to deny other units or property owners. Therefore, you're, you end up creating a, con, um, a multi, uh, an apartment, uh, a hotel or a motel environment, not, not a multifamily environment and it's my feeling if that's the case you need to require everyone to submit for rezoning in in a zoning classification that would allow hotel or motel but i'm i'm just totally opposed to uh, allowing short-term rental in existing multifamily units thank you thank you anyone else to my right Good morning, Council. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you again. I also understand, I think I have more than anyone else in the audience, a unique perspective from being able to sit there and try to see your problems and your dilemmas about how to deal with this issue. The, as I understand it, the biggest concern that everyone seems to have is when we start looking at apartment complexes and start looking at condominium developments that were in commercial zones. Well, those are things that can be handled through an exception to the existing ordinance without throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Because the proposed ordinance would virtually kill the industry. I don't think any of you would want to go through the uncertainty of trying to invest 80 to 100 to $120,000 on a maybe and then hope that things work out. Because that's what happens with the conditional use process. Contrary to what anybody says, nothing is guaranteed in that process. It's a case-by-case -case basis, allowing the council, allowing the planning commission to look at each case-by-case. -case. When you don't have a permitted use of area, then what you're doing is opening up the entire city to short-term rental applications if someone wants to do them. My concern is that no one will basically want to go and invest that kind of money and hopefully come in, go through a process that may take anywhere from 60 to 9 days, depending on if people want to pass it, if they have to table it, whatever. But now you spent the money and you then only found out you can't do anything with it. That's not reasonable. That's not fair. The whole purpose of going through making an area permitted is that you go through and then you are encouraging those folks who want to do a development to go to a specific area where it is allowed. If you take that away, then the entire city is open up. If you keep it in, then those folks would gradually go to the commercial districts. So instead of killing the entire industry or creating such market uncertainty with investors that they can't do anything, then I would ask you 
to, if the concern is truly the condominiums and apartment complexes, I think the president has a, a an amendment that would probably solve that problem. Basically, looking at any units for more, they would go have to go through a conditional use if they were in even in a commercial district. That puts that control back into you because there's not a condominium apartment complex around that doesn't have more than four units on parcel. So you get to that. But in order to make this workable, you got to do this. And I know that, the, my last point is simply this, I know that the, the, the thinking is that because we're going to make everything conditional use, see how many people have come in and, and applied. Well, I look at it just the opposite. People understand that this is going to be conditional use. This may not ever happen. So if you want to get in, try to get in now. But making it everything conditional use. Sorry, Mr. Stallworth, your time is up. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. Is there anyone else to my right? Anyone else to my right? Anyone in the back? Good morning. Dennis Smith, 1664 Beach Boulevard, Biloxi. Uh, the, the ordinance that uh, you're talking about changing, it, it's always been there, and the uh, conditional use has always been there. The conditional use hasn't been used. It works. It should be used. There's no sense in throwing a baby out with the bathwater because you want to accomplish certain things with short-term rentals. To just crush everybody's property values who's already has commercial property through the years and put real estate companies out of business and to just stymie the development of Biloxi. Uh, you know, to amend the ordinance, that's fine. Maybe tweak it, but there's gotta be some type of exception in here where you can protect future development and still protect people's property value from older developments and put the uh, condition of use where it belongs. It's always been there, it just hadn't been used. Use it in the cases where it needs to be. Whenever there's an exception in an area that's perhaps an RM30 residential, well, use it, that's great. But if it's, if it's commercial property, it, it's got to have the right to short term or it's, it's not commercial property. That's really basically all I have to say changing things uh, and, and, and stepping up rules to make things better, more controlled in short term, that's all great ideas. But this is kind of arcanian to just crush everything in development of Biloxi over the idea that somebody's going to get into short terming for short term rental that shouldn't be. You, got, you already got the safeguards in place for that. You're not going to let anybody come in there and do something they shouldn't do. But to wipe out the commercial value of the property, I just don't understand it. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you, sir. Hey, did I miss anyone? Jim York, 1664 Beach Boulevard. Um, I just want to say as an investor, I would really like to buy another condo or two in commercial area. The problem is now if I try to buy it, there's a roadblock because you know what? I have to write a contingency against that piece of property until it's approved to be a short-term rental. So it makes it very difficult for me. That's kind of a roadblock. That makes me say, do I really want to invest here? Because if I have to go through a roadblock each time I buy something in commercial business, it's not worth it. And I'm not the only investor that would say that. There's many out there that say the exact same thing. It's going back to the old state that if I'm a barber and I want to open a barber shop, I can go down to buy myself a nice commercial business or building, I should say. I can open my barber shop. And then I don't have to go through any kind of conditional use to become a barber. I go down and get my license and I'm a barber tomorrow. We're just looking for the same thing and to be treated the same way in commercial business. I agree 300% when it comes to residential 
and, and the areas that really shouldn't have short-term rentals in it. I agree with that. But with commercial business, there's a lot of heartburn from a lot of people regarding that. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. With that being said, we're going to move on from our citizen comments and we're going to go into our policy agenda and discussion. Mayor, you have anything on the uh, policy agenda or comments? How about the council? I'm going to start with Mr. Barrett. Mr. Glavin. I, I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, you know, I know we have the, you know, the existing ordinance uh, we feel is difficult and causes complications. I almost feel like it's the motor vehicle for hire reincarnated uh, a little bit. But um, so the, the, the two options uh, that we're, we're kind of considering, the two major options among others, as far as what qualifies for short-term rentals is going from neighborhood business, commercial business, regional business, downtown and waterfront, which is all allowed by right, correct? Uh, changing that to conditional use. So there has to be an application for that. Um, and I believe what Mr. Hingen is uh, saying is to take the conditional use component of your R20, R RM30, which primarily, if you get that, that's for apartment living and uh, people that are living and working uh, in the Biloxi area and making those a no and grouping them in the same category as single, single family homes. Um, the additional uh, requirements as I read through this in include maintaining a register, which I like, an application fee, applying for a privilege tax, which all businesses should, um, having a max occupancy card and, and allowing or not allowing the uh, privilege or the uh, tax, the license to be uh, transferable. Um, those are good things, you know, and if we take baby steps as some people have uh, suggested, I think that's the minimum we ought to at least put into the new proposal. Um, do we get strict and say RM20 and R30, it's not allowed? I don't know if at this time we should make that decision. We can always come back to the table if we see conditions in our area warrant that. Um, I kind of like the proposal of making uh, going from yes to conditional use for neighborhood business, commercial business, and others, because it allows us some oversight to approve that new business or that new environment going into a certain area. As we've seen at, at council meetings, there, there are conditions such as residential populations in and around an area that, that's wanting to move to short-term rentals, and that should be weighed and considered. When there's heavy commercial or uh, hotels, motels, or it, it seems there's a need for it, then we should logically follow that path and, and approve the short-term rental application. So uh, it's a complex issue. It's a very emotional issue when you're talking about property owners and their investments and what they feel they should be allowed to do with their property. And um, but the owners in and around that area also have rights and quiet enjoyment on what they invested in that property too. So um, it's not going to be easy on, on what we have to decide as a, as a council as we move uh, toward our meeting later on this afternoon if, if we do anything uh, to make the changes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Glavin. Dr. Tizel. Yes, I've spoken on this uh, and to many of you out there that, that have spoken today uh, over the past year, a year and a half. Uh, I certainly understand the market is looking for certainty and there's a lot of uncertainty in the market right now as has been pointed out. Uh, I, I just would make an observation that it's interesting that uh, some investors have in fact rolled the dice by purchasing properties and then operating them as short-term rentals 
for a number of months, perhaps years, and then only recently have applied for permits. And uh, that uh, they purchase these properties uh, with a large degree of uncertainty. And now they're hoping that the die is cast their way in their favor. Now having said that, um, it's, Mr. Hengen's propo proposal is interesting. Um, right now, the, the current proposal from the Planning Commission is to make all short-term rentals conditional use. They're prohibited in single-family residences and conditional use currently in RM20 and 30. And RM20 and 30, pretty much apartments, is that all that includes, Jerry, is just apartments in RM20 and 30, it's just the density difference? And I'm thinking if I was uh, going to purchase an apartment, it's going to be my dwelling. It's just going to be for me and my family. It is, in fact, a single family dwelling. Just happens to be vertical as opposed to horizontal. And uh, for that reason, I, I think Mr. Hengen's suggestion requires some consideration. Um, I think if you're operating a commercial business, which is what a short-term rental is, I don't know that I have a problem with that operating uh, uh, as a, or, or having a right by permit in commercial zones. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have any heart. I don't think I have any heartburn at all over that. That would give the market some certainty. But again, what really has caused this to become contentious, in my opinion is that when the rock was lifted on short-term rentals, there were a lot of short-term rentals under that rock. And uh, in fact, when I spoke with someone from Airbnb, a regional manager, and I asked how many short-term rentals are there in Biloxi, and I was surprised that he told me. He says, well, right now, just on the Airbnb platform, we have 110 properties listed. And for probably a year and a half, possibly two years, we've only had anywhere from 1 to 14 listed in short-term rentals. And then again, there's a safety issue associated with having these commercial businesses um, inspected every year by the fire department, which, by the way, puts an additional burden on the fire department. Right now, they're inspecting 14, and what's the current count waiting in line for short-term rentals in, in, the, in the application pile, Mr. Creel? Two hundred. Okay, so number one, uh, even with an air of uncertainty, the short-term rental market has been, in fact, booming. Okay, but now that we're looking to regulate it, number one, to get it on the city's radar so it can be inspected, and number two, to add certainty to the market, we're trying to find that solution, that balance today. So anyway, I don't have anything uh, further to add to the discussion at this point. Thank you, Mr. Gaines. Thank you, Dr. Tisdale. Mr. Deming? <coughs> okay, come back to you. Okay, Ms. Newman? I'm feeling the same way. Um, I mean, I understand what the Planning Commission is trying to do, but it does concern me of putting more red tape on the commercial side of it, especially the condominiums that have been in the process of doing it. I think they feel like um, it would hurt their industry tremendously. And uh, I think every situation is different, so therefore I understand the need of wanting to do everything conditional use. But I think everything is um, going back towards Cypress Cove and you're trying to um, make everything be the same but yet it's all different. Cypress Cove I think is a totally different entity because they have a legal issue going on which they need to deal with their HOA and their residents and that has nothing to do with us at this moment so um, I don't know I think um, it was said that he has some kind of suggestion I would love to hear that I just I'm not sure exactly where I'm standing at the moment with this LDO because of those issues Okay. Thank you, Ms. Newman. George? 
Uh, Mr. Creel, you and the administration come over to these conditional use. You need to get up and explain to these people why y'all come over with this idea of Starwood. That's what they're listening for. If you'll remember, the charge that came from the council was for the staff to go back and meet with the planning commission to come up with a way to better track and monitor short-term rental operations that were flying under the radar and were not coming in and getting their licenses. The, uh, the 110 number uh, that we were given has actually turned out to be very low considering what's happening now. Um, again, as of this morning, we've received 260 applications but prior to the discussion uh, of consideration for moving this to conditional use, there was no sense of urgency. We had 16 applications that had been listed, and we've been talking about this for almost three years now. So there was no urgency from the people who were operating these things to come in and actually get a license. When we started talking about making it conditional use, now our office is being flooded with applications for people that want to come in and get grandfathered in before any potential changes are approved. The, uh, the Planning Commission, uh, we conducted several meetings, several discussions, and uh, you know, all remained in agreement that short-term rental should not be allowed in single-family residential. And that carried from the beginning of the discussion to the end. There was a, a suggestion that, well, maybe we need to create an overlay district. And after discussion, uh, the Planning Commission decided that no, the overlay district would allow short-term rental and single-family zoning, and they did not want that to happen uh, either. The uh, third recommendation, which seems to be the most significant, has to do with, well, why don't we take all the areas and just make conditional make a short-term rental a conditional use in in all the zones rm20 rm30 and the commercial zones that would allow a hotel we recommended that the staff did and the planning commission agreed with it other than maybe two members that uh, that looked at this as a property rights issue one of the reasons that we think short-term rental should be conditional use is because there are circumstances that exist in some of these condominium developments that we're not aware of. And as we conducted these public hearings, what happened is that we, even in Oak Shores and even in some others that came in, there were actually permanent residents that were living in that complex that came in and said, we don't want this here. We don't want this to happen in this complex. We bought this condominium unit to live in. Those are permanent residences of Biloxi that had this been a use by right, they would have been robbed of their voice to come in and tell us anything about it. Most of the circumstances uh, or the conditions that we're finding out about, uh, about short-term rental are actually coming in from residents that live in some of these complexes that are bringing things to our attention that even we didn't know about, you know, uh, issues regarding the, the subdivision covenants, which are already in the ordinance now, the, that someone has to comply with subdivision covenants. So uh, we feel like that those people need to have a voice uh, to be able to at least come and speak. Conditional use is not taking anything away from anybody. Uh, what it does, it just makes them go through the process, come in and explain it, and if they, if they agree to comply with all the conditions that are, are listed on the conditional use approval and the short-term rental uh, regulations, uh, unless there's something unforeseen, then uh, they can be considered for approval. Now. One of the things we run into, and I don't want to get into the weeds with Cypress Cove right now, but one of the conditions that's in there says that the Planning Commission and the City Council have the right to take into consideration the surrounding area 
and whether or not the short-term rental operation works well with the surrounding area. In some cases it does, in some cases it doesn't. The other advantage to conditional use approval is that we always have a safeguard in place. Conditional use approval means that as long as the operator is complying with all the conditions, they can continue to operate. But if they violate or repeatedly violate some of the conditions there, we have the right to take them back before the Planning Commission and back to the City Council so that the City Council can either uh, revoke, give them a ch an opportunity to correct it, uh, whatever the violation is, or uh, ultimately the City Council has the right to revoke that conditional use permit. So there's, there's a safeguard in there uh, so that someone doesn't just fly under the radar under this, this guise that, well, it's a use by right, so, you know, uh, we, they really can't do anything except maybe find us. We can continue to operate. Uh, I made a misstatement when this was addressed with the Planning Commission, and this was one of the things that, that I think has, has been an issue. Um, the question came up at one of the Planning Commissions about whether or not short-term rental would be allowed to be transferred if someone decided to sell a unit. And the answer to that question is yes, it can be transferred. Uh, I was thinking about, when I answered that question, I was thinking about bed and breakfast. A bed and breakfast cannot be transferred from one owner to the other. But because short-term rental, if it were a conditional use, the conditional use runs with the land. So if someone buys a unit, they decide they don't want to continue to operate it. They decide to sell it. The conditional use it can be transferred over to the other owner without that new owner having to come in and go through the conditional use process. Um, just, to, just to summarize, uh, as a use by right, there, prior to this discussion, there didn't seem to be any sense of urgency on the part of any of the owners to come and get license except for a handful. Uh, some of the neighbors uh, suggested at the meetings that they had this helpless feeling that if they were living at Oak Shores, for example, and the, and the uh, short-term rental was allowed as a use by right, that they didn't feel like they were being protected or even considered. That was one of the statements that was made. Again, in, in the situation where we have permanent residents of Biloxi living in a complex with a place where investors are buying the remaining units, the permanent residents feel that they're being robbed of their ability to come in and speak to the council, the planning commissioner of the council, and tell them what their concerns are. Or in the case like with Cypress Cove, Cypress Cove was a, the group that brought it to our attention that there was a subdivision restriction in their language. We were not aware of that until somebody produced one of their contracts where they had bought that unit. The ones that are grandfathered in, the ones that are applying now that are being grandfathered in, will continue to be grandfathered in provided that they, are, they remain in compliance with the regulations. Uh, they won't have to come back and go through conditional use next year. All they'll have to do is come back in and renew their license, and as long as they stay in compliance, there's no problem there. Grandfathering also can be transferred from one one owner to another. So if we have a, a unit owner that gets grandfathered in and they decide to sell that unit, the grandfathered in condition continues unless for whatever reason they cease to operate for a period of one year, then they would use, lose the grandfather status and at that point would have to come back in. The other changes that were made or changes that we just feel like were or recommended, or changes that we just felt like were necessary in these situations where you have multiple units, uh, there needs to be a register uh, being kept by whoever is in charge, so that if we have problems, you know, we've had problems during some special events where there were 20 people crammed into a one-bedroom apartment for a, a short event. Uh, we run into that all the time. 
then the owner needs to maintain a register so that we can track whoever was there in case there's something that is uh, that happens, whether there's a crime that happens or whatever. There needs to be a tracking system so that we can find out uh, who those people are, where they're from, and uh, and what dates they stayed there. We also need to maintain the uh, in the situation where there's not a resident manager, there definitely needs to be contact information for someone in charge that can be reached, that can provide 30 minute response time to whatever that unit is so that uh, the, the city can investigate what was going on. One of the changes recommended is the annual fee of $100 and that's simply a renewal fee every year for coming back in and renewing your business license which is, is also part of the, the regulations. They would also have to provide information about what agencies they list with. You know, are they listed with Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway? Are they listed with multiple agencies? We need to know that information. One of the other changes that we're recommending, they would have to have a, a certificate of occupancy showing that it's now being used for commercial purposes, a certificate of zoning compliance, a privileged tax license, and something new, we're, we're producing occupant limit cards. I signed 30 this morning for some of these units. Uh, occupant limit is based on the square footage in the structure and the number of uh, approved exit doors that are there. That's just standard building code language on any structure regardless, commercial, residential, whatever, the number of people that you can put in that unit or that dwelling is based on how many square feet and how many exits you have to get in and out. So this is just uh, complying with the building code as it's written. One of the suggestions that uh, was made was in, in lieu of us requiring the license plate number of the tenants that are staying there was that uh, a lot of these people uh, may use Uber or may use a taxi to get from wherever they're coming in, if they're flying in from somewhere to get there. And I think this is a, is a reasonable recommendation. I think it's a good thing and, and um, something that we should have considered. Rather than the license plate number, that we say the license plate number or the driver's license number. And I've talked to some of the people, the real estate professionals that are, that are uh, uh, registering these short-term rental people and they said that they always get a driver's license number if they don't get anything else they have that information and that's not creating a burden for them we did make a change recommended change on the number of units that you could have uh, on a single piece of property rather than say uh, they limited to four units what we did is to actually change that to make sure that they're complying with the density limits that are already in the land development ordinance that uh, in the case of RM20 or RM30 what that means is 20 units per acre 30 units per acre or whatever the commercial zoning would would uh, allow it's already in the regulations but we've emphasized it again that any request for short-term rental must be in conformance with the subdivision covenants or deed restrictions. The property owner, the burden is on the property owner to provide that information to us at the time that they make their application. For any short-term units that are approved, this is also a change. The City of Biloxi, in addition to notifying the Hotel and Motel Association, Hotel and Lodging Association, which we already do, we will notify the State Department of Revenue and the Harrison County Tax Assessor because uh, tax assessments are based on the use of a piece of property, not on the zoning. And if what was a single family structure being used for residential purposes is now being used as a commercial venue, the tax assessor needs to be aware of that so that they can adjust the taxes accordingly. Fire department inspections, 
um, will be subject to annual review. Uh, they have already, they were already doing those inspections. One of the problems though is that when you have units that are flying under the radar, there is no fire department inspection. If, uh, if we have units that are operating without a license uh, and, and it's not reported to us to investigate, then you have people coming to Biloxi and staying in a unit that may not have been inspected by the fire department, probably wasn't inspected. And the last recommended change is the penalty uh, for violations of the ordinance, which is uh, going from $25 a violation to $500 per violation per day. And many of our ordinances are already written this way that uh, if we have a violation on a certain piece of property and it's not corrected, then that violation is duplicated each day until the violation is removed. And believe me, that, uh, that gets violators' attentions whenever something like this is happening. Both the Planning Commission and the staff believe that the conditional use change is necessary. And I'm looking at this not only from an economic development standpoint. As y'all know, I fight for economic development projects. And I, I certainly don't try to fight against anything that's reasonable. But I'm having to look at this not just from an economic development standpoint, but all the way through our process to a code enforcement standpoint as well. How do, we, how do we enact code enforcement on situations where someone may be operating and we're not even aware of it? So I'm considering the whole process, the whole development process from start to finish. We've had investors that came in and said that um, they bought these units um, and it was obvious some of them even admitted during the Planning Commission hearing that they had not done their due diligence. They didn't use those words but that was the, the, the interpretation. Uh, they just assumed, you know, that they could buy the unit and, uh, you know, anytime you're investing in property and you're going to be using it for a purpose other than what it was designed for you always make those extra phone calls and do the research to make sure that you're going to be allowed to do what you're going to be doing. There was also a suggestion that, uh, well, conditional use, you know, it should just basically be a rubber stamp that, uh, you know, uh, if, if we bought property in RM20, for example, and it says conditional use, then uh, that means uh, that we should just be allowed to do it, and that's not the case. The whole reason that a public hearing is required for conditional use is so that other residents or, or neighbors that live around the area can come in and make their statements about considerations or concerns that the Planning Commission and the City Council should have before they grant this. And a number of those concerns and considerations were brought up as this as this hearing went through. That's pretty much, uh, pretty much the extent of it. Uh, both the staff and the, and the uh, Planning Commission believe that conditional use is the way to go. If there's nothing wrong happening, there's no reason that an applicant shouldn't come in and apply if it's a reasonable request. The, both the Planning Commission and the City Council have been very reasonable in their consideration of all of these applications that have, that have come in. Um, but the neighbors should have a right, again, these are permanent residences of Biloxi, some of them should have a right to be able to at least voice their concerns prior to a decision being made. If, uh, if conditional use were just a rubber stamp, there would be no need for a public hearing and the staff could just look at the ordinance and issue the approval and let it move on from there. So that's, uh, I think that's the bulk of the information to bring you up to date on where we are. 
Well, actually, I have a question, Jerry. Did you look at any other options other than conditional use to do the same thing, or you have no other options to follow? Well, I mean, you have three options. You can either not allow it, you can allow it as use by right, or you can allow it as conditional use. And conditional use seemed to be the, the most logical to get all of the facts before the Planning Commission and before the City Council so that the decision could be made. Uh, most investors, uh, when they're looking at this type of a situation, are not going to be deterred by going through a six-week process, you know, if <coughs> all, the, all the conditions are reasonable for what they're asking for. Another question, why are they grandfathered in? What rights do they have just because they apply? Well, because under the, court, under the current ordinance right now, it is a use by right. So the ones that are coming in, now we're not talking about the ones that are operating illegally, that are operating in single family zoning or anywhere else. The ones that we're talking about right now are the ones that are in a zone that where it's allowed as a use by right, CB, RB, DT, downtown, WF waterfront, uh, all of those commercial zones that allow hotels, if they come in now while the ordinance is in place and, uh, and fill out their license, they're getting grandfathered in. Now, we are making sure that they're being inspected by the fire department, the building department for, for safety issues. But if they get grandfathered in again, that grandfathered in use will not go away and, and can be transferred as long as they don't cease for at least a year. I still don't see how that's the right way. You just apply and it's automatically got it because it's by use. I mean, I don't understand how you can grandfather something in when nothing's been passed. All they're doing is applying for something. Don't mean they ain't going to get anything. I'm just saying, but you just, because it's by use, well, it's we, the right by use to do that. We have to comply with what the ordinance says right now until changes are made. So if changes are made, then any new applications coming in, any new applications coming in after the council votes, would be uh, have to comply with the new regulations, but right now they're just having to comply with what's in place at this time. Now, the other thing you, you're talking about these condominiums that getting these things paid, like Oak, Oak Shore, and then you have people that really don't want it that live there. Mm -hmm. Okay, the same thing is like the man we're talking about in Cypress Cove. When you got somebody coming in a party and they have 25 people in a room that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And whatever happens, get in a fight, shoot each other, break their arm, guy dives off, kid dives off the pool, they're going to sue the city, they're going to sue them. Who are they suing? They're going to sue the money line, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're going to be involved in that because we gave the right to do that. Well, so and I there's a contact person who lives in North Carolina. That's a joke. That most of these people don't live here. The contact person's not going to be here. Mm -hmm. So how do you control that? Call well, the Cypress fire department, call the police department, same old thing, you know? Cypress Cove is a is a classic example, I believe, of why conditional use works. Uh, you had, uh, you had uh, units that were being sold to investors after residents had signed a contract saying that uh, there would be no short-term rental there. And because it was conditional use, it gave a chance for both sides to bring their argument to the table, to the Planning Commission and to the City Council. And that's why we believe that conditional use would work in the, in the other. That's one of the reasons we believe that conditional use would work in the other zonings as well. Oh, the driver's license. They have to have a driver's license. They have to have a driver's license in the state of Mississippi, or just a driver's license. Well, anyone that's renting, it's either a, in order to provide tracking. Uh, for uh, police department and for code enforcement that uh, uh, anyone that's registered there, the, the, uh, the entity that's taking the reservations, whether it's a local real estate agency or whether it's uh, Airbnb or whoever, would have to either have a tag number for the vehicle or in the case where there wasn't a vehicle, they'd have to have a driver's license number for whoever registers that room so that we have the ability to track who it was when they were there. and. Uh, uh, follow up on anything that that may be a concern. So it don't have to be in Mississippi; it could be anywhere. That's right. Just a, it's just a tracking. Yes, sir. <clears throat> right. Go ahead. Next. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deming. Yeah, 
recap. I'm still kind of at a loss for words, <clears throat> but I'll take a stab at this. Um, Mr. Creel, the only question I have for you, and I don't know if you recall the, the and he mentioned the Motor Vehicle for Hire Authority, and I was part of fighting through that process because one of my concerns is is overwhelming private businesses with red tape and then governmental bodies micromanaging them. Uh, a lot of the stuff you talked about that's in, in this, the new requirements for short-term rentals, well, I'll probably talk more about um, when this comes up for a vote, but one thing that just stuck out to me is why would they have to tell you who they list their properties with? That, that's just one example of, of my concerns with micromanaging because if, if they're required to keep a register, which they all do anyway because they take money and payments from these people, mm -hmm. um, and if they're required to do all of these other things, why would they have to tell you? I just want to know the rationale for why they would have to tell you every site that they list their property on if they're complying with all of the other aspects of this ordinance. We believe that gives us another venue for tracking uh, how and why that unit was rented. Uh, we've talked to uh, well, the representative for Airbnb, and they've expressed a willingness to. Well, and that's fine. But and, and again, if you say that it's, it's for tracking, well, if they're applying for a license, that you know that they're there and you know the property and the unit. Mm -hmm. So that just seems like, that just seems duplicit when you talk about keeping tabs on on what they're doing. I, I think it's um, it's an unreasonable unreasonable um, request. But we'll go through that more. I don't have any more questions or statements for you today. The, the biggest problem with this is is I'm a, a huge private property rights guy that gray area between where somebody's rights start and somebody's rights finish is, is what's at stake here. I mean, the Marvers are here and they've brought an attorney, which demonstrates how impactful somebody else's rights are going to be perceivably on their rights. And so this is extremely um, tenuous for me because I want people to do what they want with their property. Mm -hmm. However, I don't want people to be harmed by what other people do with their property. We, so. we believe we believe too that people should be able to do you know what they want with their property but this is a reason that zoning exists is to make sure that someone doesn't come in next to a single family house and open a hotel uh, consider this if the council chose to allow this in let me back up we have a number of operations that are going on in single family zoning right now where uh, with no license, no approval, people bought houses and are using them for short term rental. The zoning is single family, which means that it's supposed to be permanently occupied by a single family. The operation of short term rental next door is basically a zoning change without a zoning change. You're, you're essentially operating a hotel next to a single family house and there was no public hearing there was no consideration given to anything so we're addressing those through community court and that's not one of the recommended changes mr creel i'm sorry if we are there any are there any zones that allow by right hotels or motels the, the ones that I named off before. Well, if, if, See, we, if we equate short-term rentals to hotels and motels, then why would they not be allowed by right in those zones as well? Because you have mixed uses of people living in those zones. Uh, the example that I gave you before, you've got some people that are living there as their permanent residence, and you've got some some people either investors or others that are buying and using that property for another purpose and uh, and both the planning commission and the staff felt that uh, consideration should be given to those other voices that uh, that uh, have concerns about it and then ultimately you know the council is going to make the decision based on the preponderance of of whatever is presented at the hearing but uh, there were, I believe there were people that bought <clears throat> units in good faith, thinking that they would not have to worry about short-term rental moving in next door, 
and uh, woke up one day and there were short-term rental units next door and people changing in and out that's disrupting their their uh, their livelihood I, and I agree with you yeah. in in some respect in other respects I disagree with you um, I think that there are some that if they buy into and, it and and I'm playing devil advocate for the most part here when you mm -hmm. when you say that certain people should do their due diligence mm -hmm. and if someone moves into a zone where a hotel or motel is allowed by right then they were on notice as well that a hotel or a motel could pop up next door to them mm -hmm. um, and so while that doesn't convince me either way of, of how this should play out I just want to point out that there are some some conundrums that we have to face here and at the end of the day it comes down to the rights of people and their personal property well and we we realize that this is not a perfect solution I mean this is we're still going to have people that are going to be flying under the radar this is not a, a perfect ordinance it, and Biloxi is not the only city that's going through this there are other cities that are communicating with us waiting to see what we're going to do because they're going to consider what we do as a, a part of the decision making for for their city too but going back to the intent what was the intent what was the charge from the city council to the planning commission go back and find a way for us to better to monitor and track these short-term rentals that are not on the radar now and we believe that we've done the best that we could do uh, will we revise this later on yes as as more issues come up along this line we'll come back with uh, with tweaking recommendations to uh, to address those but for right now considering everything that we're we're facing we believe that we've done as much as we could to uh, address those issues and uh, uh, put it before the council for consideration I, um, again thank you I agree with you that I think that there will always be people flying under the radar and the more stringent we make the requirements to comply with and the more um, the more excessive we make the punishments we're going to see, continue to see the black market and it will continue to emerge um, I have nothing else thank you thank you mr. Demi mr. Baird yeah, I just have a couple questions um, and like Robert uh, we're gonna rehash all this again at 1 30 so a lot of them I don't need to ask now but my first question is um, you said we had 278 applications at this time no we've got 260, 260 we have 78, 78 that have actually been inspected that's been inspected mm -hmm. okay so hypothetically you pass this ordinance as is every one of these did I hear you correctly when you said that every one of these has to have a public hearing no not the ones that are no, no, not these in the future okay. any, any in the future past any in the future that come in after the changes are made any that come in would go through the conditional use process. so hypothetically we see a boom and there's 500 people a week applying for short-term rentals mm -hmm. every one of those have to have a separate public hearing yep but one of the things to remember about what we're doing right now is that the majority of, of these applications are coming in from one uh, complex I mean you know uh, Ocean Club Seabreeze Oak Shores Le Chateau Grand have multiple applications and all of those could be heard at at one time so it so would, it could yeah so it could be heard at one time my other question is um, hypothetically again this passes my my fear is that like you said everyone's going to fl fl just fly under the radar what happens in that case if we pass this this as as it's written now and then the whatever 150 people just decide you know what i'm just going to do this and what 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 kind of recourse is there i mean how do you shut that down well it would all be handled in community court uh, we would we would write it up we would take it to community court uh, we think that what this does these recommendations do is create a sense of urgency that doesn't seem to be out there right now and uh, and would make neighbors aware that that they have a, a voice to call in or or let us know send us an email to let us know that there's something unusual happening next door in the unit next door whatever and we would send our code enforcement officers out there to investigate and if that is the case then we would just follow the community court process okay and going back to my first question 
So if you had multiple units per week or, or people from multiple areas within the city per week apply for these and it was an ongoing deal, mm -hmm. we would have to have multiple public hearings with the planning commission and then each one of those would have to be voted on individually by the council after y'all made a recommendation uh yes and no yes each one would have to have approval but if you'll notice the way that some of these have come to you it would have like three or four units in one complex that's not what i'm asking the same i'm saying i'm saying outside of the one complex let's say this does take off Mm -hmm. and there was multiple complexes throughout the city where people applied each one of those that was a separate complex would have to have a separate public hearing with planning commission that's correct and yes. then each one of those that was in a separate complex would be on the agenda separately to be discussed no uh, each one individually could be lumped together in one request which is the way that it's been coming from so commission. even though it's in different complexes, that would be one no, no, request? no, no. If 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 you have so multiple, if you had ten complexes okay. that had to have public hearings. Okay, maybe I misunderstood. Ten the requests question. in different complexes, and then those ten different requests that came from different complexes would those be in one item on the agenda? No, if they were in different complexes, items on the agenda right. to be discussed? We have to address them uh, specifically with the land that they're on. So. If there were 10 units in 10 different complexes, there would be 10 cases on the agenda. Okay. Okay. That's all I have for okay. now. Thank you, Dr. Tizell. Mr. Deming asked a good question that was in my mind as well, this tracking the listings by platform, Airbnb, HomeAway, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about taxes. Who pays the taxes? If I list with A, B, and B, does A, B, and B pay the applicable taxes, or am I required to dis? That's what I, that's what Airbnb has told us. Now we understand it's different with different agencies. Okay. So Airbnb then collects uh, the taxes off each transaction, basically. That's what the gentleman told All us. Right. Yes. And and so they're reporting to the Department of Revenue, mm -hmm. and they're ensuring the Department of Revenue ensures that we get our share of taxes. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to list with any platform. And uh, how does anybody know whether I'm paying my taxes or not? Or do we worry about that? And maybe I'm, maybe I'm in, maybe I'm a conditional use that is permitted. Mm -hmm. That that's up to me. There's no way of tracking. So if and I'm just looking at the numbers aspect, if I know who you're listing with, then I have an idea that the taxes are being paid. Mm -hmm. If I'm running it uh, as an independent operator, so to speak, then you don't know whether I'm paying taxes or not. Um, when we report this to, I can't remember, is it hotel? And lodging. Mm -hmm. it, okay, are they, are they able to verify who's paying taxes or not? I, I suspect they're not. All they can do is basically tell the Department of Revenue, hey, Paul Tisdale's running a, a, an right. operation out there. Uh, Which is what we're, what we're doing right now. Right. We have a contact there. They can't give us any information, but we can report it to them, and they have they have a, a, a greater range of ability to investigate than we do. Uh, they can actually talk to neighbors, you know, about whether or not something is actually being operated there. So uh, something that, for tax purposes, something that we can't get into. Okay. And for enforcement, uh, will you, if, if we're really going to look at $500 a day, Per violation mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that um, are you able to divorce to devote anybody on staff or additional personnel to monitor this yes is we'll have one person one one code officer that will be responsible for short-term rental and that that will be a sole responsibility okay um, What's the zoning? What what zoning do condominiums fall in? They can fall into a number of them, but typically it's RM20 or RM30. Okay. Uh, there are some that are in the commercial zones. All right. So so under Mr. Hengen's proposal, some of those condos, depending on their zoning, yes. would would be permitted by a right, and others would not be. And. If 
I understood you correctly, since the city doesn't get into enforcing homeowners agreement or or uh, deed restrictions, that kind of stuff, that that's between um, the property owner, so to speak, <laughs> that's correct. and and who, whoever buys that unit. Um, can can code enforcement pull a permit? I mean, if we permit my short-term rental to operate and I don't comply, you get a lot of police uh, calls about uh, uh, people on my property that mm -hmm. aren't behaving or cleaning up or whatever. Can you deny me a permit the next year? The uh, I, would, I, I, I couldn't I, deny the permit. In other words, if uh, but uh, I would hope that before we got to that, that we would have already addressed it through the conditional use. Uh, well, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. For yeah. conditional use, yeah, I could uh, look. Y y you're presenting such issues. You're violating the conditional use. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't give you a permit to operate, or we withdraw the conditional use. That's correct. But okay. but if a conditional use is not required, if it's a use can, by right, can I can I and but can I and for can I enforce appropriate behavior by my guests on my property? Can you enforce that by withholding my permit the following year? No, I can't withhold a permit. If they come in and the zoning is correct, unless there's some legal action that's been taken to prohibit that from happening, uh, I'm not allowed to withhold a permit. And that legal action might be that somebody decides that my rental property is a public nuisance. That, that's correct. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I got just Go one comment. I want to follow up on Dr. Tisdale's questioning about how do we verify that they, if they're not on one of the platforms, you know, how can we verify that they're collecting the taxes or what have you? One of the things that I like in here is that you're requiring the register of guests and, and that log. So if there is an audit by mm -hmm. the Department of Revenue, they may be able to reference those logs and cross-reference it to the income that was collected. Mm -hmm. And that gives them an avenue to, you know, do a successful audit. All businesses, you know, in this industry and in all industries are subject to audits and are, are usually every two or three or four years, usually those entities are audited. So uh, I like those components and conditions that you've put into this and I commend your department and the Planning Commission for bringing these recommendations to, to the Council for us to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. George? I just uh, listen to everybody talk a little bit here. I'll ask you one question. It sounds like the city don't have much choice to anything in here. We can't do much to anybody. You can't deny nothing. You're not sure if you're going to collect any taxes. Or we're going to have a lot of headaches, and your department can't handle it. You're going to have a lot of problems. You're talking about three, four hundred short term with one guy? I ain't going to get it. Mm -hmm. So all he's going to do is cost the city a ton of money. Can we, obviously, uh, can we collect the taxes? I don't know who they send the taxes to. Uh, can you deny anybody because they're doing everything wrong? No. You got all these people out here right now doing everything illegal. And what are we doing about that? Nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably more than 300 or more doing it. So it sounds like to me what we're doing, we ain't accomplishing anything for the city. We didn't collect much of anything, but we're going to have a big headache. They're going to cost us a ton of money. That's well, what it's going to do. It's your office. You're going to wind up with more, more, more than one person probably. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a headache now, and uh, we're hoping that this will uh, relieve uh, the symptoms, some of the symptoms of that, uh, that headache. Uh, I mean, look, we can only address these things. That when they come up, uh, we, uh, we take steps to change the ordinance. Uh, make recommendations to try to to bring it under control or at least get it to a point to where we can monitor it or track it uh, and and we think that you know with all the discussion on both sides and all the recommendations that were made we think we've come up with something pretty good here that will help us track it and monitor it again it's not a perfect recommendation but it's a start and uh, and we're going to uh, we'll get in there and we'll address it just like we do any other code enforcement issue let me ask you a question, Peter. What legal rights the city has in this, legally? What actually can we do to do anything to collect the money, enforce it? Where does the city stand on that? I think the $500 fee is going to uh, deter people from flying under the radar because it actually makes it 
uh, and through the community court procedures, we're working on that to eliminate some some procedures that have been put in place in the past where out-of-state people couldn't go to community court. They would have to come in to hear through code enforcement. And uh, we're going to put that back into community court. So we think that's going to be streamlined, some of the code enforcement. But uh, what the city can do, I mean, we've got to know who's doing it before we can do anything. And that's what this is designed to do. Well, that, that was one question. The second question, how about somebody doing it and doing anything wrong? Kind of like what Paul said. Uh, where's the right for the city to stop any of that? Well, the fine is $500 a violation. And, uh, you know, when it was $25 a violation, you could just, add, they could add that to the to the fee. And I've looked at some other cities. Uh, I think Gulfport is, is follows what we're doing. They're putting in a $500 a day vi violation. And uh, we could go up to 1000 you know, if, if we can't control it. But for now, we're just recommending $500. Well, it was a violation when they called the police and had a fight, say, in the apartment? Is that a violation of $500? I thought it was about a violation of someone not being not registering or applying and still running a short-term rental. That's uh, all you're doing with the $500, correct? So I'm talking about when yeah. you have a problem in that condominium or the short-term rental, where, where, we, where we have our rights as a city. They do come up on the city. Well, they come up on annual renewal, and that when they come up for annual renewal, the community development is going to review uh, – they're going to review their records and proof of taxes. And if somebody had a, a list of issues, I think that would be taken into consideration. But you can't deny it. Uh, you can, can you actually can, cut them off and deny it. You could deny it. had that kind of control. You could deny an applica a reapplication, a renewal. You could deny that. Mm -hmm. You've got to have rules and regulations, you know, whatever we do in the city. I mean, that's why we have that, you know. Otherwise, you could have a gas station on one side of your house and an adult bookstore on the other side. You got to have some kind of control somewhere. Now, it's like you said, this is a perfect solution. Probably not, and it probably have to be tweaked later on or whatever. A lot of options people are going to have, you know. But I still don't believe the grandfather. I don't think she can grant just because you got an application. And I don't know if that's legal or not. I just don't say you can just automatically give it. I mean, I'll run up that apply right now. I don't think the grandfather works that way. Grandfather's people are already in action, already doing stuff. Well, we have some of them. I have no problem with them. That's been doing it. But the people that apply, I don't think grandfather works. I can't support something like that. That's all we're up to apply right now. Uh, Mr. Deming, and then I'll make some final observations and comments after Mr. Deming. All right. Um, just a thought, and, and because like I mentioned before, the connection between this ordinance and the <coughs> black market is tenuous at best, in my opinion. And it's because even if you increase that penalty, penalties don't deter activity unless they're aware of the penalty. Mm -hmm. You've talked to the people from um, BRBO or Airbnb, you mentioned one of them. Are they willing to inform the people that register on their platform that the penalty for not being permitted is $500? Or how do we get that information well, to potential renters? I don't want to speak for him, but um, the the tone that I got uh, seemed to be, you know, we're willing to help you in any way we can. Just let us know what we need to do. I said, well, here's a simple way you can do it. Don't let anybody register with Airbnb unless they can show you they have a business license from the city. We can't do that. That, that would be just too voluminous. So I didn't get the sincere feel that they really wanted to help us. You know, matter of fact, I was reminded, and I think Dr. Tisdale told me this same thing. I was reminded again that, you, Mr. Creel, you do realize that short-term rental is not going away, that it's here to stay, uh, which, you know, we, we brought that up several times to y'all, that it's not something that's that's going away. So what we've got to do is to just come up with a reasonable way to regulate it. <coughs> Mr. President, I don't have anything further. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to make some uh, uh, last observations and, and comments. Um, you know, the, the issue we have here is RM20 and RM30, uh, RM20 and RM30 zones that are next to family resident zones. And 
Our goal is to protect the residents and allow commercial business their freedom to invest in their designated areas. I like some of the ideas that Mr. Creel uh, have with multiple units of uh, the rules that he's implying. I like the penalties that are there. However, I'm a big advocate of uh, overlay district and, and that's the thing that I've been trying to push for a while so that we all know exactly where people can and cannot go. Right now, I think we need to do more of uh, uh, some mini steps, baby steps, take light steps in this area. Um, the suggestion I have is taking things one step at a time. Um, right now, the, the, the big thing is leaving the existing plan in place, uh, the existing language, but add some of the following things. Any apartment complex or area that have more than four or more apartments, resident, condos, or what have you, those should be brought before the city uh, uh, in, in the uh, going through that the process of uh, the public hearing and things like that. So as it stands now, I don't think I could support it as it stands because of the, um, uh, the dynamics of it. I still won't want to have the freedom of the businesses, but I want to protect my residents. And I think if uh, we do an overlay district, I'm a big fan of the overlay district, that, in my opinion, will resolve a lot of the issues. Okay, let me, uh, let me just answer that, because I, I only mentioned that one time in the opening remarks. Uh, we've actually gone back to the Planning Commission twice and asked for consideration for an overlay district, and both times it was overwhelmingly uh, denied. Uh, you know, the first question was, to, do we allow it in short-term rental? No. Second question was, do we want to create an overlay district? And both times we've taken that to the Planning Commission, the vote has been not to allow an overlay district. So, did did they give a reason why? They believe that it would it would undermine the the first question, that it would. Uh, allow short-term rental in areas that are now single family, uh, you know, which is what we've, we've discussed before, uh, you know, maybe having an overlay district that went one or two blocks in from Highway 90. Uh, we made that suggestion to them, had that discussion with them, but uh, when they finally finished their discussion and voted on it, uh, they didn't go for that and, uh, and turned it down. I have no further, further uh, comments. Anyone else have any further comments? Okay, with that being said, let's uh, close that. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Dr. Tisdale, second by Mr. Lawrence. Questions? Yep. All in favor? 7-0. Consider the meeting closed. <laughs>